Hey there guys, Troy Gretsch from Mintedrums.com here with another video for you. Now in this video, I'm going to take you through how I build my studio. Now when I say studio, it's kind of more like a, a practice room within my house. Now this isn't a gear video, so I'm not going to show you all my recording gear and cameras and all that stuff. That's not what this video is about. This video is about how I made a soundproof practice space. Now, when I say soundproof, I'm being really loose with that term. Now, to make something 100% soundproof is almost impossible, but you can get close to or bringing down the volume enough that it's not going to affect the people around you. Like, for example, what I've got in my room, uh, this is a room within my house. It's actually right in the middle of my house, pretty much. And it's a room within a room. And when I close it all up, my wife can watch TV in the lounge room and it sounds like someone down the street's playing drums. Also, my room is right next to my neighbor's outdoor entertainment area. And if they were out there, they could probably just hear it. But if they were in their house, they can't hear it. So yeah, I'm pretty happy and stoked with my practice space. Would I like it a bit bigger? Absolutely. There's always something that you would want to improve. But um, in general, I can't complain. I'm very fortunate to have this space, especially during these like crazy lockdown times. It's It makes a massive difference. So hopefully this will shed some light and give you guys some ideas. So the reason I've decided to do this video is because recently, especially with everyone being in lockdown in Melbourne, people are having problems with practice space and all that kind of stuff. And a few friends have hit me up asking how I soundproofed my room and all that. So... And I didn't realize how much people actually were into this kind of stuff. So until they started hitting me up on Facebook and liking the pictures and I've got it on my Facebook page, all the step-by-step -step pictures. So I just thought I'd just put it in a video and break down everything so you guys can have a better idea of what to kind of expect or uh, what you would want to do when you're trying to build your own room. So without further ado, let's jump in. Now, full disclosure, when I built my house originally 10 years ago, I knew this was going to be my practice room. On the plans, it said theatre room. And uh, that was just because of the builder, how they had it on their plans. And I discussed with my wife that, you know, this would probably be a good place to have my studio because I didn't want to lose garage space or anything like that to be able to put cars and stuff in. So I, I thought, well, how am I going to do this? And uh, after talking to some friends, they suggested a room within a room. So, and I'll take you through all that in a minute, but just wanted to let you know how I started with this. So like I said, at the building stage, I knew this was going to be my, my practice room. So I took some steps to kind of start the process. Even though I didn't start building the room till quite a few years later, I wanted a few things in place. And first thing I did was I put insulation in the walls, like sound insulation. Now, I'm not 100% sure from memory, I haven't found any receipts or anything, but I'm fairly sure I used pink R2 rated soundproofing bats. These are a really stiff pink bat that were no trouble to put in. They were easy to cut. They stood up by themselves so you could get them in nice and tight, not too tight, but you know, in between all the uh, noggins and stuff like that and just basically fill up all the space in the frame with as much soundproofing insulation as possible. The next thing I did was I paid a little bit extra and I bought some sound check plaster. Now, after the fact, I realized that I probably didn't need to spend the extra money because sound check plaster is quite expensive. What I could have done is just double plastered the room, but I thought oh, sound check, well, that's made for soundproofing. I'll use that. So essentially it's 13 mil plaster and it's got some special compounds in it to help absorb sound. And my walls of my original room are lined with that. So basically it goes plaster, sound insulation, sound check plaster. Then I just had a concrete floor. And to be honest, that's how my room stayed for the next probably three, four years. I didn't have flooring in there, no carpet or anything, because I knew I was going to fit it out eventually. And the thing was, I had open double doors. My house is all floorboards through the house. So concrete floor plus floorboards equals reverb like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so playing drums in my house was quite a challenge at the best of times. Uh, you know, it, it was semi-bearable and I it got to a stage where I, I just needed to bite the bullet and get onto it. The original room dimensions before I started any kind of construction, just the shell of the room was 4,400 by 4,320 and I had nine foot ceilings, which is about 2,700 mils high so it's not a bad space it's it was a decent sized room and especially given the fact that i was going to build a room within a room i thought it was decent shell 
So the main thing you've got to remember here is that sound travels through vibration. So if you've got anything touching one surface to the next, that's going to be a transmission point. So there's a term called decoupling, and that's what you're aiming to do when you're trying to build a soundproof room. You want to decouple the internal room from the external room as much as possible. So picture a cube floating within a cube, like not touching at any point, and it's just floating there. That's what we're after. We're after like almost anti-gravity in the room. Now, we all know that anti-gravity is impossible. Or is it? Now, stage one was how are we going to decouple the internal room from the external room? And the answer to that was rubber. Rubber is a fantastic insulator and it stops vibration, electricity, all that kind of stuff going through and transferring. So with sound, it's really going to go a long way to decouple the internal room from the external room. So I ended up finding a company who uh, specialised in rubber in Melbourne and I bought these blocks from them. Uh, this is a row of four. I had cut these in the middle and used two every like half a metre under the joists and I simply stuck it to the joist underneath, so on the wood, but not on the floor because you're trying to, again, you're trying to decouple. You don't want to be holding it down in any way. And the weight of the room will just hold those in place. It's not going to move around. The mistake I know some people have made in the past is they'll do all that stuff and then they put a dyno bolt straight through the timber into the concrete floor. What you've just done there is created a transfer point and you've just wasted all your time. You want to try and isolate the room from the room. You don't want to have that transfer point. So please do not use bolts to bolt down the floor. Super important. Now, when I say I built a room, <laughs> I didn't build anything. I had a professional come in because I wanted it done properly. Now, it is a friend of mine and he did look after me on the price and so I was very fortunate and he did an amazing job. The thing I loved about Michael and his work was he was super fussy and he did probably more than he needed to but I had the confidence that this thing was going to last because it was rock solid. So my hat goes off to, to Michael for that. So the first thing he did was he did the floor, used the rubber, made the floor and then we put more of the R2 sound insulation in between the joists because when you're walking around you don't want any knocking sounds transferring out so the more sound absorption I had the better. The next step of the floor was to then put down the actual flooring and for that we used yellow tongue sheets so we yet laid out yellow tongue sheets joined them all together and then it was totally fine to nail them down into the joists because that wasn't being connected to the concrete so don't think that you can't use nails you just can't connect the internal room to the external room. You want to avoid that. So nailing the yellow tongue into the joists, totally cool. So before laying the floor out and building the floor, we made the decision to do leave a 40 mil gap between the external room and the internal room. So that meant the flooring and the walls and everything of the internal room were going to sit 40 mil off of the other surface. So next came the frame. So as I mentioned before, we just made a frame that was 40 mil from the external room and to the internal room. So we had that 40 mil air gap because what we're trying to create here is a just that. It's an air gap because this sound from how it was explained to me, it you don't want a lot of hard surfaces there because the transmission is quite high. So what you want to do is go from a hard surface like plaster to insulation, which is a softer surface, to then a hard surface. And then having that air gap will create another sort of layer that disrupts the airflow or the vibration, which then deadens the sound a lot more. The wall frames went up. Um, they were pretty standard. The main concern that I had with building the room within a room was I'm quite tall and I didn't want to lose a lot of height in here. I didn't want to walk into a room where I felt uh, cla claustrophobic and I just wanted it to still feel kind of big. So one of the suggestions that Michael made was to rather than just build a standard roof, we could use uh, steel beams and that would m allow him to create a stronger structure and that we wouldn't be worried about hanging anything off um, and we could retain some of that height. So from memory, I think those beams only sat about uh, 20 mil from the ceiling itself and then the the roof or the ceiling the internal ceiling of that of the internal room was built off that and then with the floor raised floor and the lowered ceiling that left me with around eight foot of 
uh, ceiling height, which is actually still quite good. So once the frame was done, that was pretty much it for Michael. He ended up coming back to put in my windows, which I'll get to a bit later, but the rest was up to me. So whilst I was waiting for everything to, else to happen, so I was waiting for windows to be delivered, I was waiting for the plaster and I was going to do all the insulation, I thought I might spend that time and make the doors. Now the room had originally double doors on the front and I didn't want to lose that kind of feel in my house. I wanted it to feel the same as it did before but have obviously much thicker, more heavy duty doors that would seal properly. And I mean I'm a drummer, how bad could I could I do? So, <laughs> so anyway I gave it a crack and I essentially just made a couple of sets of double doors that would lip and over each other and those doors Turned out actually quite good. Uh, I'm pretty happy with those. Um, I'm happy to make another video to explain the breakdown of exactly how I made those doors. If that's something you're interested in, please hit me in the, up in the comments and I'll look into doing that. Then what I did, which was kind of a little bit backwards, was I, I instead of putting a hard surface on the outside, I was advised against that by a, a fantastic sound guy uh, named Will Burston who's in Melbourne, but Melbourne based, he works with everyone. So when Will tells me something, I'll sort of take it as gospel because he really knows his stuff. He, now he advised me not to have two surfaces that were like plaster and plaster because it would have the opposite kind of effect and it could actually help transfer the sound. So having a hard surface go to air gap and then going to a soft surface, etc., and carrying on would make the biggest difference. So rather than putting a hard surface on the outside of the frame, I just put some of the uh, builder's foil, insulation foil around the outside of the frame. I just stretched it around. It was quite tricky. I wish I had done it before they put the walls up and decided that. It would have been a lot easier, but I, I did it. So that allowed me to put my insulation in and not worry about it falling out. I knew it was gonna be secure. Now, another thing that Mr. Burston pointed out to me uh, was the importance of oxygen. And I remember this conversation vividly. He said, so what have you done about fresh air? And I said, oh, what do you mean? He goes, well, do you want to just pass out and die in the room? Because that's what will happen. You're building a soundproof room. It's an airtight box. You're going to run out of air. I was like, hey, it's not a bad idea, Mr. Burston, because I'm severely allergic to dying. So I thought, you know, hey, that's not a bad idea. So, and he explained to me how to do it and it made a lot of sense. So essentially I've made two rectangle boxes with baffles in them. Air comes in one way and it goes around and then by the time it comes out, the sound is almost entirely gone, which is incredible. And again, those boxes, I'm happy to make another video in depth about how I built those. It's nothing crazy, but if that's something you would like to know more about, please hit me up in the comments and I'll make a video just on that. So I've got one box of fresh air coming in with a fan on the outside, pushing the air through and then I've got a box with a fan on the outside sucking out. So essentially I'm getting air circulating through constantly. Once my air was taken care of, the next thing was lights and power. So I had an electrician come in, they ran the wires that needed to be run for the down lights and that was simply connected to a, I had a single baton light in my original room and that just had a connection coming out and the lights came through into there and the light switch was moved into the room and power points were moved into the room as well. And it was really important to get that stuff done, like data points and all that kind of stuff before you start doing insulation there because otherwise you're just gonna be backtracking. So make sure you've got all your electrical stuff going and done before you then start the insulation process. Next was insulating the room. So I started with the foil on the outside and then I had the insulation in the walls and that allowed it to stay in nice and tight and nice and snug and I wasn't worried about it going anywhere. So just before I went ahead with the plaster, my windows did arrive. So my chippy came back and he installed those for me. And what I ended up doing was I had had an original window in there that was an awning window. So an awning window is simply a window that you wind and it can open. So half of it was like that and the other half was just a flat window. And I was really into the idea of being able to still open those windows and get some air in here. But I wanted it to still have almost like a, a double glazed feel or a double glazed effect. So what I did to try and achieve this effect was on the external room, right in front of the original window, I put in a six mil laminated slider. So that's just a six mil thick glass sheet and it's 
on a slider so I could slide it open and I could still access that awning window and open up and get fresh air. Then on the internal room, I had another slider, but this time it was double glazed. So it's actually a double glazed window on the internal room. So essentially, if you think about it, I've got double glazing on the inside and double glazing because I've got two windows on the external room. It's essentially double glazing there as well. So that not only allowed me to retain my original window and have access to fresh air in my room whenever I wanted, but it really helped me retain a high level of acoustic suppression. Because at the end of the day, I wanted to be able to spend hours in here playing without really affecting anyone else's life. Then once the insulating was all done, I had my plaster come in. Now, like I said earlier, the original room had 13 mil sound check plaster. I, after speaking to some people as well, I was advised that the sound check is a bit of a ripoff. Whenever you do anything that involves sound or acoustic stuff, the price just goes through the roof. So getting Soundcheck Plus at 13 mil, whilst it might be a little bit better and a little bit denser, the having two layers of 10 mil plaster is just as effective. So all I did was I did the internal room when it came to plaster time, we did double sheets. So I had my plaster of George come in and myself and my brother were here and we were hanging all the plaster and we did two layers essentially through the whole room, walls and ceiling. So then the plasterer stopped everything up. We went and sanded it all down so it was ready for paint. And then the next step was cutting the holes for the power points and for the downlights. And we got the, all those out and connected and then we were ready for paint. So originally I had no idea I was gonna be doing a lot of video production stuff in this room. So the color scheme I went for was like an olive green on the wall behind where my drums are. And I, uh, and it looked great. I really liked it. Um, it wasn't until later on down the track where I realized it doesn't look that great on camera and black just looks so much better. So where I was before versus where it is now is, is quite different. So what I've got in here, I've actually got some waterproof downlights that I used in like bathrooms and stuff. That way they're sealed and you're going to stop as much sound going through as possible. You're still going to get some sound leakage, but hey, you know, it helped a lot. And then under the bulkhead where my fresh air system is, I've just put in three LED downlights. Now I've later swapped the globes out to be daylight balanced ones or as daylight balanced as possible. So it looks better on camera, but I'll get into all that stuff in another video. Now, the last step was the floor coverings. I could have gone with floorboards, laminated floor, whatever, but I decided to go with a quick install carpet, which is like little carpet blocks that you could buy from Bunnings, and I laid them down. Now to save a little bit of money, I actually bought them secondhand from an ex-office uh, supplier. So they were pre-used, but they looked great and they were in great condition. And I saved, I think I got them for a quarter of the price of what I would have normally. So, and at that time, uh, money was a big issue and not that it isn't now, but it was more so of an issue. So where I could save money was, you know, saving money was saving money. The beauty of that is if I want to rip up the floor and change it, it's not a big deal. I can just literally pull them up. In fact, I didn't even glue them down. They still had a little bit of the tackiness from the pr previous install. So I found that once they were all joined together and on the floor, nothing was popping up and they haven't moved. I run over these things with vacuums and all that and really abuse them and they haven't come up. It's amazing. And also means that when I go to rip them up later, I'm not gonna wreck my <laughs> subfloor pulling them up. Now, one of the last things I had to worry about was sealing the doors. And for that, like I said, I'm gonna do a whole video on how I did that. But in a nutshell, I used a product called Raven Door Seals, and I they essentially just seal up the door all the way around. And the results were, were quite good, considering I'm not a professional door maker. Um, I've found most of the spillage comes through the downlights and through the roof. So, you know, I could probably go a bit further and, and try and button that up a little bit more, but I'm quite happy with the results. It's, it's fairly good. So, at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. How good is this room within a room and how soundproof is it? So what I'll do now is I'll show you guys what it sounds like playing music loud in the room with the doors open in the house. And then I'm gonna close the doors and you can see the DB reading from out there. Now, again, from speaking to professionals in the industry, I've learned over the years that essentially every 10 dB drop in sound is perceivable as half. So when you, if you're at 80 dB and it drops to 70, it sounds like the volume's been cut in half. You drop it by another 10 dB and it sounds like it's dropped in half again and another 10 dB and it gradually goes down like that. 
So let's see how good the room actually is. So there you go, that's how I built the studio. To say that I'm happy with this room is an understatement. I'm very fortunate to have it. I love it. It gives me my own, like my wife says, my man cave. And I come in here and I get to do these great YouTube videos and have a bit of separation. And I feel like I can come in here and play and I'm not bugging anyone because that actually is a big deal to me. I don't like annoying people from my playing. So if I know that it's not that loud, I can feel a little bit better. If people still get annoyed, even though I've gone to all this trouble, well, that's their bad luck. I've done a lot and I've spent quite a bit of money in here. So it's, you know, if it's not good enough for you, I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you very much for checking out this video. If you did like it, please hit that thumbs up. And if you're not already a subscriber, please consider subscribing for more free video lessons and other drumming related content. I'll be back next week with another lesson for you. So until then, have a fantastic week and as always, happy practicing.